Well, it's that time of year again. A time of togetherness. A time for family. A time to reflect on all the great things that blessed us this year. A time when everyone can come together and watch a bunch of YouTubers cram their opinions down your throats with an absolute deluge of top such and such of the year. Well, here's another one. Twenty twenty two. If I could describe it in a single auditory note, I think it would be. Eh. It was a year of many games that were, you know, enjoyable to play at the time, but flawed enough to not necessarily be that memorable. Soul Hackers, Digimon Survive, Star Ocean, Tweedledee and Tweedledum all fall under this category. However, there were also a lot of games that came out this year. So much so that I didn't even get a chance to play everything I wanted to. So who knows, uh, maybe I just bet on the wrong horses and the Live Alive remake was actually Game of the Year material. I, I may never know. Uh, in any event, amongst the mediocrity, there were several games that did manage to stand out, and so, as such, here are, in my opinion, the best games of 2022. First up, we've got I, the Somnium Files, the Nirvana Initiative. It's no secret that I adore the Somnium Files. What at first glance seems like another quirky little Spike Chunsaw visual novel in the vein of Zero Escape eventually proved it could stand firmly on its own two feet and establish itself as one of my favorite games of all time. So, as a result, Nirvana Initiative is in the unfortunate position of having to be compared to the first game, and it's, um, well, it does about as well as one could expect, I guess. Alright, let's not beat around the bush here. The Nirvana Initiative is not as good as the original. A lot of the humor is just taken wholesale from the first, some but not all of the new characters feel poorly fleshed out, and there's a general sense that the game as a whole is missing just a bit of the... a bit of the heart, I guess you could say, from the original. But despite that, the game is still the Somnium Piles and still well worth playing if you've played the first. And it does surpass its predecessor in a couple key ways, most notably gameplay. Uh, the Somnium Dives fixed basically every problem I had with the original. They're more fun to figure out, they're less trial and error based, and most importantly, they are a lot more creative. From flight to game shows, from heartwarming father-son moments to a freaking Pokemon Go parody. Uh, there's even this one really surreal nightmare-like Somnium where you like, keep revisiting the same empty room and every time it gets a little more ominous until the room fills with water and you keep going down and time's running out and oh, man he was fucking effective also ryuki and tama fit into the role as co-protagonists like a glove and mizuki and aiba are just as awesome as ever so overall i think the nirvana initiative very much deserve its place on this list next up we have Ho oh, ho ho! Hell yeah! Yeah, here we come! The king is back, baby! The god of tactical role-playing is back from the dead! Here to crush all the puny mortals that stand in his way! Yeah! <clears throat> uh, yes. Taxi Silver Reborn. The remaster I've been waiting years for. And yes, right off the bat, let's get this out of the way. Asking full price for a remake of a PSP game, which itself was a remake of a Super Famicom game, is a lot to ask. And so, because of that, it's only gonna end up third on my list. But, make no mistake, this is the game I will have sunk the most hours into come year's end. It is clear a lot of effort has been put into this port. A smoother look and apparently some redone sprite work on top of voice acting and a remastered soundtrack are your basic bread and butter, but on top of that you've got changes to the overall battle system as well as a ton of quality of life improvements. Just the changes made to crafting alone make this game a million times better than its PSP counterpart, but on top of that you've got a fast forward button, recipe and weapon drops no longer require a fucking massive Excel spreadsheet to figure out, archers and ninjas are no longer the de facto best physical unit in the game, Deneb's Weecha class no longer takes 30 fucking years of grinding in the Palace of the Undead to lock, the list goes on and on. It's just, there's, there's so much. I love it. Aside from that, there's not really much to say. It's Tactics Ogre. It was my favorite game going into this year, and it will remain my favorite coming out. Hail to the king, baby. Okay, 
Okay, okay, okay, okay. I know, I know, I know. This is technically cheating. This game came out in 2020, 2019 in Japan, but it did get a port on the Switch this year, which is the only reason I found out it existed, so... It's here. 13 Sentinels I Just Rim is a visual novel slash real-time strategy, technically, uh, by Vanillaware, whose only other game I've played is Grim Grimoire, but it's probably best known for Odin Sphere. Uh, anyways, I Just 13 Sentinels Rim, despite its clunky title to say, is freaking awesome! You follow the story of 13 separate individuals going through their own little stories, which each add into the overall arching story that spans the entirety of the game, and the game's philosophy on this is basically plot twists from the word go! On top of the basic humdrum premise that surrounds the game of, you know, giant monsters appear, let's get a bunch of teenagers into giant mech suits to go fight them, the game throws any number of crazy twists your way. One guy's an assassin from the future with amnesia, one guy's going through Groundhog Day, only the day always ends with the planet getting destroyed. You've got android replicas of characters, a cute little robot that's basically E.T., a talking cat, space idols, an army of T-1000s, and my personal favorite, a time-traveling soldier from World War II, slowly but surely coming to terms with his own homosexuality. The game is just insane, and the fact that it manages to take all that insanity and make an actually cohesive plot with an actual rewarding payoff is nothing short of a miracle. Okay, you may end up having to go back and rewatch a scene or two to wrap your head around everything because they're throwing so much at you, but the fact that I can keep straight each and every character in this more clearly than I do the characters from, say, the much simpler Digimon Survive, which I played around the same time, should say something. Thing. Now, the game is far from perfect. Uh, when the game decides to turn into a semi-real-time strategy, it is far less impressive. You play a sort of eye-in-the-sky view where each of your and enemy units are little more than dots on a big map. It would benefit greatly from some more visual feedback, honestly, which is weird because all your mechs and attacks do have these, like, Super Robot Wars-style animations. It's just, for some reason, you can only see them during the select screen. Overall, the combat is just not very interesting to watch, and that isn't helped by the fact that it's also generally pretty easy. Still, despite that, the story more than makes up for it, and as long as you space the combat sections out rather than try to slog through them all at once, it isn't too bad. On the whole, I had a lot of fun with Rim 13, I Just Sentinels, and look forward to whatever Vanillaware sets their sights on next. It was nearing the end of winter. Spring would be on its way soon. But before we could escape the icy embrace of the snow, one game would change everything. A game so big and expansive it would put all previous attempts at open world to shame. A game filled with intrigue, depth, and mystery. A game that would seek to challenge you at every turn, that tried as hard as it could to become the next bold innovation in gaming as a whole. Anyways, I didn't play it because I was too busy playing. Triangle Strategy. I gotta say, going into this, I wasn't expecting much. Well, that's not entirely true. A completely new tactical RPG, largely inspired by Final Fantasy Tactics. I mean, yeah, obviously I was excited. Finally, some pandering directly to my ridiculous tastes. However, I was skeptical. This is Squeenix we're talking about, after all. My bets were firmly hedged in the shit story, good gameplay department. However, the story did surprise me in being actually competent. Okay, it's no Shakespeare or anything, the main characters are all rather one note and the villains are literally just SMT villains, meritocracy versus theocracy. However, the game takes a simple but effective approach at creating its own little world with its own customs and beliefs that I found myself getting rather on board with. A large-scale war between three nations, each their own good and bad sides, mostly bad, and you, a small but powerful house in the middle of it all. Technically, you're part of one of the nations to begin with, but that nation is swiftly conquered, and you eventually have to decide whether to try and rebuild it, join one of the other sides, or just straight up run away and start anew somewhere else. It's all very simple, but I think it uses that to its advantage. The main focus of the story is moral choice, similar to Tactics Ogre, where you have key choices at certain points that can drastically affect how the story plays out, but no matter what decision you make, they will eventually converge, at least at some points. 
The simplicity of the overall plot helps to make the actual decisions you make feel actually relevant, I guess. Normally in moral choice games, there's very clearly a right way of doing things. The Chaos Path and Tactics Ogre, most neutral endings in SMT. In Triangle Strategy, a lot of the choices actually feel moderately even. I mean, some of them are pretty black and white, but others actually made me question whether I was doing the right thing or not by going one way or another. Which I gotta say, is surprisingly rare in these kind of things. But make no mistake, the plot was a nice surprise, but the real reason I got into it was for that TRPG-style gameplay. And personally, I think the game is a treat. As I said before, the game is obviously inspired by Final Fantasy Tactics, but rather than mixing and matching classes as you would in that game, instead each character has their own completely unique class, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. So you've got healers, non-healing supports, DPS, tanky guys, they even tried to make a fixed earth petition, which I mean, bless them for trying. But that shit can't not be broken, um, and you not being able to mix and match stuff until you completely break the game, which does have its own appeal, don't get me wrong, the game manages to achieve one of those rare experiences in tactical RPGs, where the game actually feels challenging without feeling like it's just throwing a bunch of stats at you. I had a blast going through this game seeing what each character was capable of, what characters worked particularly well together, what characters were particularly effective, and why was the best character always Medina. I couldn't believe it. They'd really done it. They made a game that built off the ideas of other games, but did it in such a way that it managed to create its own very functional identity. And so, as such, Triangle Strategy easily deserves its place as my favorite game to come out this year. And well, that's all for 2022, at least for me. Thanks a bunch for watching, and hopefully my next video won't be so opinionated. Uh, till then, see you around.